In this episode of the Backpacking Light podcast, we talk to Backpacking Light staff writer Mark Weatherington about Wendell Berry, through hiking versus shorter trips, backpacking in the southeast, and more. Look for me in the mountains where walking has a way of pulling you to your peace of mind. Welcome to the Backpacking Light Podcast. I'm Andrew Marshall. This episode is an author spotlight, where we chat with frequent BPL contributors about their backpacking backgrounds, favorite pieces they've written for us, their writing processes and influences, and more. In this episode, we're chatting with Mark Weatherington. Mark and I have a shared love of backpacking and Wendell Berry, among other things, so it should be a good interview. Remember that you can listen to this entire interview if you are a Backpacking Light member. If you aren't, and you'd like to be, visit backpackinglight.com slash subscribe. Okay, with that out of the way, enjoy our chat. My guest today is Backpacking Light staff writer Mark Weatherington. Mark began backpacking in 2007 as a student at the University of Kentucky, and since then he's been exploring the southeast and the west on foot, bicycle, and skis. Mark's writing has appeared in Backpacker Magazine and Trail Groove Magazine in addition to Backpacking Light. Mark, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Andrew. Glad to be here. Tell us a little bit more about those early days discovering backpacking at the University of Kentucky. Yeah, so I didn't really grow up backpacking. I, you know, did some car camping with my family and some short hikes, you know, nothing over maybe two, three miles just to sort of, you know, waterfall, scenic overlook, that type of stuff. Um, Most on the way down to visit family in Georgia. I grew up in Louisville, Kentucky, and family's all from South Central Georgia. So we'd sometimes break up the drive staying in the Smokies, uh, which was, you know, pretty formative uh, for me in certain ways of just really appreciating those lush landscapes and all the water and just the clarity of some of the pools and the trout and um, you know, salamanders, I remember seeing a hellbender salamander. I had kind of a weird tolerance for cold water, I guess, as a kid. So I'd bring a snorkel and snorkel some of those pools while my dad was fly fishing. And I remember swimming over a hellbender salamander one time and seeing that kind of, you know, so that sort of sparked a curiosity of nature and, back, and you know, experiencing those landscapes in me. And then when I got to college, uh, you know, it had some more free time and a little closer proximity to national forest and the Smokies and places to go out and backpack. I just sort of caught that bug and it was, you know, and I did it, you know, probably, you know, in 2007, when I started, it sort of, I think my approach to backpacking rings true with the Mark Twain quote about how he'd like to be in Kentucky at the end of the world because it's always 20 years behind. Because I started using backpacking gear that was, you know, kind of hand me down from Boy Scout stuff that was you know, big Kelty external frame pack, you know, four pounds, zero degree sleeping bag when the low is going to get to like maybe 40, um, canned food, that sort of stuff. And just really, um, but then very quickly realized how unpleasant that was, but how much I enjoyed the, you know, being out there. And so that led me to do a lot of reading and I worked in a library on campus. And so I was just, you know, would constantly when I had any downtime read, you know, all the guidebooks they had of, you know, hiking trails in Kentucky or hiking in the Southeast. And, and then also not just guidebooks, but also some of the nature writing about Kentucky. The um, Wendell Berry's book, The Unforeseen Wilderness, uh, was really something that was a huge influence on me in terms of appreciating the landscape as well as how to think about the landscape, which I guess are sort of two different things. Like you can appreciate looking at a really beautiful view, but not exactly think about things. And um, that book was really, it, and it was neat to live only about an hour away from the Red River Gorge. And then I later worked there with the Forest Service. So that was really sort of a formative thing that all sort of, you know, those first sort of five years or so of my backpacking and, you know, young adult, you know, college, post-college thing was really, um, yeah, heavily, mostly, almost exclusively in the Southeast. I didn't go out West until I'd been backpacking for about four years to Southeast Arizona, a friend I'd worked with with the Forest Service was there. And then me and a girlfriend at the time went out there for spring break and had a great time backpacking in the Chiricahuas and 
seeing that landscape and that's what made me ultimately want to move out west um, and yeah and that was I touched on some of that in that backpacking tide article where I talked about setting a goal of trying to spend 10% of the year outside and most you know all of that was you know in the southeast and also going back to some of the same places and exploring for waterfalls and really yeah just spending as much time as I could in there and just trying to learn as much as I could about it. It was really, really something else. So that was, um, yeah. Yeah. The, the Wendell Berry thing, the Wendell Berry connection is I think really an interesting aspect of understanding you as a writer, because I think that you have a really deep connection to place and you're interested in exploring uh, deeply rather than broadly, right? Um, and, and not to say that you don't appreciate both things. Your your most recent piece that we that we just published um, kind of explores the idea of like weighing uh, through hiking versus like uh, a deep exploration of a single place. But Wendell Berry is kind of when I think of him as a writer, I think of very specific place-based pieces. And I think that that's also what I think about when I think of you as a writer. Yeah, I think it's, yeah, the kind of place-based approach to, yeah, my kind of relationship with landscape is really, yeah, I'd, I'd say heavily influenced by Wendell Berry. And it's almost sort of one of those interesting things where, you know, if you look at a lot of the backpacking media, you know, you know, not even social media, but, you know, 15 years ago when I started backpacking, it was a whole lot of go here, do this, go to that place. You know, it was very um, focused on having that very broad approach where you're going and hiking, you know, this trail somewhere and then going there for a two week vacation to hike somewhere else. And it it was sort of cool in a way, you know, both it's to sort of almost have permission and perspective from someone to be very rooted to having your experiences all on, you know, one kind of national park or one kind of ranger district of a national forest and spending the bulk of your time there rather than feeling like you have to kind of keep up with the Joneses. And if you're not hiking, you know, this trail in this season and that trail in the other one and kind of, you know, flitting around, which, you know, is, um, you know, for whatever reason, it's just not something I've really, really done. And it's interesting to yeah, sort of reflect on and try to, I don't know, try to express my experiences and what it's done to sort of enrich my experience through that lens and to have someone that sort of paved the way to at least acknowledge those thoughts and that they're, um, yeah, it was just sort of a neat counterpoint to some of the, yeah, more kind of typical approaches to what it means to be a backpacker. And there've been some other great articles about that too, about through hiking versus, you know, are you really a backpacker if you haven't hiked the triple crown? And, uh, but yeah, Wendell Berry's, you know, fascinating person and a great author and a, you know, um, that was just really neat to be able to read that and sort of apply it. So, yeah. You, in your piece, the rewards of repetition, you, you really kind of dig into this concept of returning to the same spot over and over again. Can you go into that a little bit more? Like, what do you get out of going up to the same Alpine Lake two, three, four times a, a year or a season as opposed to seeking out new experiences? say like, I mean, the first and foremost sort of like cliche trope would be like, it's almost sort of like a homecoming, you know, like if you're, if you're, if you've spent the night in those places that many times, or there's places a day hike to, you know, frequently, but those are more sort of fitness conditioning kind of hikes. But yeah, for the ones where you go and spend the night, um, it really feels like a return to something that becomes kind of more comfortable every time. And for me, from an appreciation standpoint of it, I feel like when there's not really any navigational issues, it's not, oh, how far are we to the junction, this or that, or I wonder where I'm going to camp at this new lake. It's sort of, you're able to go on autopilot to a degree that's, um, I think, sort of easier to get into a state where you're appreciating the subtleties rather than the, you know, spectacular stuff. It's kind of like, 
you know, the first time you go there, it's, oh, look at this stunningly clear water, look at that jagged peak, and look at the kind of, you know, smattering of snow under there and how beautiful that is. And then when you go there again and again and again, it's sort of, you know, oh, look at the way the wind is pushing the water and sort of, you know, making that ripple on the lake and look at the way the, the large needles are just beginning to turn and starting to blow in the wind. And it just, I just think it's, um, it, you know, I've had conversations with other backpackers about this where, you know, some are very much wanting to go to new places. And, you know, the kind of counterpoint that I offer is like, you know, you never just listen to like your favorite album one time, or, you know, most people that have a favorite book have typically reread it. And I think you get a deeper appreciation and, you know, it's certainly never a waste of time to do something you already enjoy doing. You know, you know, you're going to like the album, you know, you're going to like the lake, you know, you're going to like the book. And I just think I, um, for me, maybe I'm, you know, stubborn or dense, but it takes multiple times for me to get something. And, you know, I often repeat myself in conversations and writing and stuff. And I'm just sort of a repeater type person, I guess, but it's, um, it, <laughs> I don't know. It, it's, <laughs> I, yeah, that's my thoughts on that. I think it's interesting too the um, the idea of appreciating the subtle is I think something that I learned backpacking and hiking in the southeast before I moved out west because it's easy to get distracted by scenic not distracted but it's easy to focus on this vast scenery these 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 uh, grand, dramatic, you know, jagged peaks that the West has to offer, and those are amazing. Um, but you can't backpack in the Southeast with that in mind because that doesn't exist. And you could you could walk up a mountain all day long in North Georgia and never see a view once you get to the top. And so it forces you, I think, to uh, gain an appreciation for that kind of subtlety and the sort of sublime uh, aspects of of uh, of nature i would totally agree and i'm actually really grateful that i grew up you know backpacking in the southeast or not you know grew up but had my formative backpacking experiences in my early 20s in the southeast so thank you for bringing that point up because it is something that i've thought about a lot and it's it would be very hard for the people i know that have grown up backpacking in the west to go and hike you know a 50 mile loop in the smokies where you might get two vistas on the whole trip and then the rest of it you know rhododendron but waterfalls but yeah the amazing thing is you know i think there's more tree species in a mile and a half of some smokies trails than there are in the entirety of yellowstone national park you know because the biodiversity there and i think if you're clued into sort of trying to pick up on that in a more subtle way it it does change the way that you then experience you know a desert landscape or a uh, mountainous landscape because you're just you know, you have that sort of foundation of being tuned into the subtleties. And yeah, I, I really miss backpacking in the Smokies and, and the Cumberland Plateau. I was back there in late October for a trip that was just great. It was like a 30 mile trip and no huge views, um, but just really, you know, being back around all the sandstone kind of cliffs and rock overhangs and, and the cultural landscape there of seeing how it's recovered from logging and, you know, other extractive industries. And it's, yeah, the, yeah, it, I think it's given me, and maybe that's sort of where coming out here as wowed as I am by these, you know, amazing peaks and stuff, I'm still, you know, just walking along a creek really jazzed to be out there and just seeing that. So I, I would yeah, attribute that to, yeah, learning to backpack in the Southeast and knowing that, okay, it's going to be four miles of rhododendron mostly and some hemlocks mixed in, but some beautiful little tumbling creeks and you know, some red Fs or whatever across the trail that you can just kind of stop and gawk at. And yeah, it's. And even if you do get up to a, to a Vista, one of your two Vistas is almost certainly going to be socked in with mist and clouds. Uh, so <laughs> yeah. you can't even, you can't even count on that. Um, in your piece, the backpacking tithe project, you write about a concept that you developed of intentionally trying to spend 10% of your year outside um, on overnight trips. And you approach this from an aspect of piecing that 10% together over the course of the year as opposed to going out and doing a through hike. Can you 
elaborate a little bit on how you kind of arrived at that concept and when when it started to become in your head like an intentional thing versus something that you just kind of were doing? Yeah, I don't know if I can totally pinpoint. I mean, it became an intentional thing for me in 2000 seven going into 2008 when I realized in 2007 that oh I really love backpacking I'm gonna try to do this and made a new year's resolution it's one of the few I can really recall like making and actually sticking with and Mm -hmm. so that was when I started doing that Um, and some of it is I've been super fortunate and lucky privileged everything else to where I've never had a job where I'm like oh my god I'm just gonna work here a year to save up things and then move on like I've been really lucky where I've had really you know good mentors, good coworkers, good communities to work in to where I've never felt that need to like escape and break free. It's sort of more like, you know, it's just sort of worked for me, but there's also a certain timidity uh, in me personally for not having gone out and done those through hikes as well as sort of like not feeling compelled to also sort of being a little resistant to kind of the linear approach to just, you know, going um, straight, straight, uh, you know, doing committing to that and going, going on that type of trip. And I realize I'm missing something and I'm hoping to, you know, try to do that just for my own edification to experience that and have something to compare it to. But some of it's, you know, not some of it's a timidity, a lack of commitment, um, not wanting to kind of save up the money to do that, not feeling like I want to really break my life up in a certain way. Um, and now that I'm, you know, in a place where I probably could save up, you know, four or five weeks of vacation time and go do something like the Colorado trail or even something, you know, much quicker, like just go for a week and a half or two weeks and do, you know, the Tahoe rim trail or something like that. It's, it's appealing to me um, more now that I've spent a lot of time doing this, but I'm, I'm glad I did it this way because it didn't really burn you out, but some of it was, you know, factors sort of beyond my control and just being, I don't know, sort of satisfied with the approach that was working for me. Um, and also probably probably some kind of like reverse engineering of being like, well, I'm doing this and it's working for me. So let me find a way to sort of justify it or find some greater, <laughs> you know, n- n- um, you know, not justification per se, but just sort of like, you know, look at, well, what I'm doing is really working for me, but it's not what I see most other media talking about what's what's going on here and i'd still like to flesh that um you know those those thoughts out more i you know not done thinking about it yet i guess so thanks for the question it's good to have something to ponder even more uh, yeah be really and you, the juxtaposition. yeah and you're still kind of working through it you you just recently by the time this podcast airs your most recent piece for us will have been published and it's a follow-up to your original backpacking tithe project and you can sort of see you still wrestling with um you know do do i want to do a through hike or not and something fascinating i found in that article was you mentioned that you have friends that have completed through hikes that have since not been out on an overnight and it's been months or years and it's do you have you thought about that phenomenon like what's what's happening there i i don't know i think some of it might be where you know some of it's just basic kind of you know survival and financial obligations and then being tired you know and not doing that and but i think some of it is you know an approach to kind of like go big really early and then you know having done that and then kind of wrestling with that thing of well if it's not you know a month long through hike, why do I want to pack up all my gear to just go out for three or four days? It, yeah. And I don't, and yeah, I don't really know. I don't know if maybe their hunger is kind of more sated after doing something like that, or if it's kind of one of those things that, you know, I did that and don't really have much interest in doing that again for a while. Um, but yeah, it's something that would not work for me. And I mean, I've made, you know, most of my major life decisions after age, you know, 22 or 23 related to sort of backpacking and proximity to lots of public land that I can um, do. And I've, you know, spent a lot of time prioritizing backpacking. And so for me, it's just such an, it's, 
an ingrained, it's such an ingrained habit, and I, I hesitate to tread on sort of like religious analogies or spiritual thing, but for me, they're really inseparable from backpacking, and it's like, I don't know, man, like, I... I couldn't imagine being a, a practicing member of a religion and going to church for like three months straight. And then I don't really go to church for two or three years. And then I'm going to go back to church for two months. Like for me, it's like really multiple times a month spending that time because it's so rewarding for me, the way religion is rewarding and grounding and, you know, um, you know, for others. And so for me, like I, um, you know, like my mental health, my spiritual health, physical health, like if I wasn't doing it that often, it would be incredibly difficult for me. So it's hard to wrap my head around having some big, long, immersive, transformative, incredible experience, but then not really um, doing that. And I've had other people mention that, you know, that they've seen that too, where you'll have people that have hiked some of those through hikes, but then are sort of resist, you know, they're either sort of all in and that's sort of their lifestyle where they're just, you know, on the trail all the time but then there are those that seem to have done that and then are kind of well I guess I've got to work now for another year and I'm going to be tired every weekend so I'm not going to feel like going out and doing something that I think they've then learned to associate with incredible physical effort you know I'm sure there's probably I don't know because I haven't done it so I'll probably shouldn't speculate on that but I just wonder if there's an association with the sort of drudgery that I've heard from people that comes with through hikes on certain long days to where they don't want to put their pack on the weekend and then go sort of that maybe it's a interesting, a more complex memory association and whatnot than, um, than just a simple like, Oh, I don't feel like backpacking. I already did that for three months. So. Yeah. Right. I have a theory. Uh, well, first of all, I just want to comment on, I think your religion analogy is, is spot on because a lot of people do, interact with their religion in that way where they get really into it for three months and then and then don't show up again at church for two years and then show up again uh but um i think that sometimes there is a narrative that surrounds through hikes that i think goes all the way back to some of the the first books that were written about them and now i think is is even more so in terms of social media there's the idea that you're partaking in something life-changing and um, transformative, and that it, and that that transformation is permanent. And once it's happened to you, it's happened to you. And I think that people, especially, tend to think that way when they're in the middle of a through hike, um, and then they get home. And I think it takes a while for those feelings of transformation to fade. But I, I do believe they always fade. And I think it just takes people a while to realize that the act of walking through the woods for three months is transformative, but not permanently. Because all the same issues that you have at home are always waiting on you. And so I think that there's this false sense of, of I've done something and I've accomplished it, and now I am a new person that sort of pervades the act of through hiking. And that's why I, I like through hiking and I am a through hiker, but it's why I'm particularly attracted to your approach of intentionally um, getting some of that time in in the woods in sort of a regular dosage because the benefits that you get out of spending in the woods um, need constant refreshing. That's what I think. Yeah, I would agree. And I think, you know, as I ponder it a little bit more just in this conversation, I think, you know, there's certainly an inaccessibility for through hiking for most people. You know, it, it, it just is really hard for people to get together the initial kind of capital outlay to use financial terms of, you know, taking the time off work, spending, you know, having the money saved up for doing that. And, you know, that's, of course, going to be even less accessible to people that are from underprivileged communities. But I think with something like, you know, if you can sort of normalize trying to just spend, you know, two weeks outside a year and then normalize going to the same place, you know, I, I think there's, it's, you know, there's certainly many other problems in the world and in backpacking and environmental issues and stuff, but the sort of over normalization or the disproportionate normalization, I think of through hiking is, um, 
I don't know how much that discourages people from getting into backpacking, but I think, you know, if you associate backpacking with taking months off work and doing that, I think it, and not that it comes at the expense of encouraging somebody to say, hey, just go to your local state park and car camp. You know, if that's all you have, if you live in Illinois or somewhere where there's not really any backpacking, but just saying, you know, if you go and just, you know, spend the time car camping one weekend a month and go, you know, I mean, winter months, of course, would be harder and, you know, have specialized gear for that. But, you know, to just sort of normalize going to the same places in nature, spending the time there. But yeah, like you say, sort of being intentional and knowing that that's, it's a different experience, but it's no less an enriching or has, it has no less potential to be um, enriching in a really deep way, the same way through hiking is totally different, but, you know, the sort of potential is there, but I think it's not given enough sort of, um, I don't want to say publicity, but it's, it, I, I'd just like to see more of the conversation about people just going to what's close to them and going there often and forming a deeper relationship with the place. And I think, uh, yeah, and that sort of probably just harkens back to some of the Wendell Berry stuff of like, you know, a very place-based focus and appreciating that and getting sort of an intimate knowledge and appreciation rather than kind of going big. Well, we're happy to have you and um, we love your pieces as we uh, end the interview here, uh, my final question is, what is something that you want to write about that you have not gotten a chance to write about yet? Well, I guess I'd like to write about, if I ever do a first kind of through hike, um, I'd really like to write about, you know, if I am able to get out there and do a, you know, multi-week trip. I think that is what I would be most excited about writing about. I think I've generally touched on most of the things that I find very kind of important in my relationship with the outdoors. And I think being able to do an experience that is, uh, you know, much different than any way I've spent time outdoors and in wilderness areas and up, up to date, I think that would be what I'd probably be most excited about um, in terms of a kind of personal essay type piece. In terms of a non- fiction sort of like reporting kind of like that cottage industry piece i really liked the journalistic aspect of that and interviewing people uh i'd really like to write about the uh grizzly bears that are starting to come back into the bitterroots which is the wilderness or you know the mountain range and the soway bitterroot wilderness where i do you know 80 90 percent of my backpacking uh and how that's sort of changing the way that i am interacting with that landscape where you know, the chances of me running into a grizzly bear are just increasing year to year to year and how, you know, selfishly it's kind of, you know, there's a, a great book about grizzly bears in the Bitterroot. Uh, and, you know, the author mentions in the beginning of that, that, you know, when you're backpacking in grizzly country, it's pretty much impossible not to think about that, you know, the whole time you're there, you know, any thing moving in the forest, any kind of you know, crack you hear at night in your tent. Whereas if it's just black bears, you know, I don't, you know, I certainly respect and follow all the, you know, food storage things for black bears, but you know, you, you, I'm, I'm just frankly, and maybe this isn't, you know, good, but I'm just not as worried as I am when I'm in grizzly country. And it's interesting for me kind of starting to reevaluate my relationship with, you know, having to backpack in grizzly country um, and then the whole history of the bears as they have came back, you know, and, you know, from the continental divide ecosystem and then Yellowstone ecosystem. And, you know, that's fascinating. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to probably writing about both of those and just, yeah, continuing to, yeah, hopefully. And I mean, the thing I'd be most excited about writing is anything that can inspire people to get out as much as they can to spend thoughtful time in nature, to share that with their family, to share that with their friends, to buy less, to maybe, you know, spend less time on their phone, you know, be more involved in their community, you know, but I, <laughs> I, I don't know exactly how to pitch that story because I don't know <laughs> that exists, <laughs> but it's, if I could write anything like that, I wish I could, I, if that had its impact, that, that's what I would be most excited about writing. All right. Well, Mark, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. We will put a link to Mark's 
author bio page in the show notes so you can read all of the pieces that we talked about uh, plus more. You've got a pretty extensive back catalog with us, Mark. And um, we look forward to the grizzly bear piece, which I know is is forthcoming. And uh, we look forward to the other things that you talked about. So again, thank you so much for your time. It's been a wonderful conversation. Thanks a lot, Andrew. It was a pleasure. Well, that's going to do it for this public version of the Backpacking Light podcast. If you'd like to hear the full interview, head on over to backpackinglight.com slash subscribe right now to become a member. So I shouldered my backpack, walk away from the car.